The following podcast was recorded on Tuesday, February 15th, 2022, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Training at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of our podcast series, Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish of Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Today, Jim will be discussing how credit trades and what it is signaling. Jim, as the stock market struggled this year, so have credit markets. What's the latest from credit spreads and volumes? Yeah, um, so if we jump to the first chart, I'll say for this podcast, I'm only gonna use high yield. And if I was to use crossover or if I was to use investment grade, it would pretty much say the same thing. So here's the option adjusted spread of high yield, how much it trades over an equivalent risk-free instrument um, adjusted for options, obviously. And we're trading at around 350 basis points over the equivalent uh, risk-free rate. And yes, that is the highest level since late 2020. So there's been some widening of credit spreads, just like the stock market has had its biggest correction since the spring of 2020. A lot of people have then pointed out, yeah, that's widened, but it's not nearly as much as one would have expected if you were to try to put it into some kind of a comparison with what the stock market's done. And that's somewhat true. And I'm gonna talk about that for the rest of the podcast, but I do wanna point out if we go to the next chart, what's also interesting about high yield is here is a 50 day average. I just use 50 to just smooth it out of trace volume. Trace volume gives you how many, how many bonds trade every day, the par amount. And in the high yield market, we're down under 6 billion a day. We're at, I know it doesn't show it on this chart, but we're at, a, at the lowest level in about six or seven years. So as spread started to widen out, you've seen the volume in this market really dry up. That big mountain you see up to 11 and a half billion, well, that was when everybody freaked out in the spring of 2020 with the initial uh, part of COVID as well too. So yes, credit has widened, volume has dried up, but the narrative has been, it's not as bad as the uh, stock market Credit is supposed to be the smart market. It's signaling that maybe things in the world are not nearly as bad as we think. And how does the credit market trade? The cycle is buy or hedge. Can you explain that? Yes. So what I showed was that, you know, when spreads start to widen, volume starts to go down. So if we look at the next chart, which is the CDX volume, this is credit default swap volume. So this is the volume of, of derivative instruments you would buy that are insurance contracts that would pay you if there is a default event. Well, yeah, that near 12 billion peak in this metric is the, that was the freak out in the spring of 2020. But if you look at the latest number at 7.7 .7 billion, that's about as high as you've seen in the last eight years. So while cash volume is down, protection or insurance against a credit event is up. And that has led to this idea that there is this cycle in the market that credit traders buy when they're bullish, but they don't sell when things turn south. That's why the cash volume dries up. They hedge. One, ends, uh, 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 one thing that suggests that is the high volume numbers. If you jump to the next chart, this is. Uh, um, a little messy chart, but let me try to explain. So the blue line on this chart is that cash market volume chart that I showed a couple of slides ago. The orange line on this chart is the HYG ETF. That is the iShares High Yield ETF, the most popular ETF. That's its dollar volume that it trades every day. And green is all of the uh, high yield ETFs, which is about 25 of them. JNK, which is the Barclays High Yield Index, and HYG are about two thirds of this volume. So if you look at the bottom panel, it shows you that the dollar volume, the amount of trading of the HYG ETF is over 50% of the underlying cash market. 
And all of the ETFs in high yield land taken together are over 80% of the underlying cash market. Now, if you look at any other sector in the ETF land, even investment grade or gold, or if you were to look at biotech or energy or international or take your pick, nothing trades to this degree to its underlying. Almost all of the volume in high yield ETFs equals the volume, 80% is of the volume of the underlying cash market. Most other markets, it's like maybe 10 or 15% at the top or maybe 5% of the underlying market. Um, you know, so uh, the, the, all of the S&P 500 ETFs in total, their dollar volume is a couple of percent, three, four, 5% of the total dollar volume of the S&P. But in high yield land, it's 80%. So really what we've done with high yield is there's an old adage in the bond market, uh, in the stock market, that it's a market of stocks, not a stock market, meaning they're individual names, don't lump them all together. I think that more applies in the bond market, but we now trade it as a high yield market, just buy HYG or sell HYG. And part of this is that hedging that we do. So if you go to the final two charts, the next chart, there is an options contract that trades on HYG too, and it's fairly active. And so there's the price of HYG in red in the top. The blue part on the bottom, or in the middle panel, the blue is the put volume of HYG. It's exploded up. It's near where it was when everybody was panicking, put volume, in the spring of 2020. But that orange line of call volume, it ain't doing anything. So really what happens is buy the hell out of, out of a high yield, when you think things are messy, you can buy CD uh, credit default swaps, or maybe you can short the HYG ETF, or just buy a bunch of puts on the ETF. And if you go to the final chart, the final chart is the same thing, but it's open interest. And that orange line, which is put open interest, is at a new high. So this is how we trade this market. You buy or you hedge. You buy or you hedge. There is no real selling that goes on in the market. Now, what's been a catalyst for this? These instruments have definitely been a catalyst that you can hedge it. But also, I think the 2020 experience. Remember when the market freaked out in 2020, the Fed came in with extraordinary actions. Two of those extraordinary actions was they were buying investment-grade bonds outright, and they set up a facility to buy high-yield ETFs. So there was an adage on Wall Street in 2020, co-invest with the Fed buy credit, especially high yield, because the Fed, the, 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 the organization with the unlimited printing press is going to be buying the same things and they're not going to let it go down. And even though the Fed is no longer in the high yield or investment grade market, the belief is if it gets wobbly enough, they'll come back. And so that's why you see that the market has changed its stripes to a buy or hedge. There's never a sell. And that's why when people look at credit spreads, yes, they've widened, but that may account for one of the reasons why they have not widened as much as you would have expected if you were to put them on equal footing with the stock market. So what changes all this? Is it inflation? Yes, it is the inflation because there is an underlying assumption here in this market that the Fed's priority is growth that they will never let a reverse wealth effect or anything that would hurt the economy come down. So own credit, if it gets messy, the Fed will come in and support it. But if the new priority is inflation, and this is something we've talked about on this podcast and I've talked about in our conference calls and we've written about in our news clips and stuff, if the new priority is inflation, the Fed's not gonna ride to the rescue and you might wind up seeing that there is no backstop and that you know you might need more than a hedge in order to protect yourself against widening credit spreads. So if these markets get a little messier in the spring because of a fear of inflation, I think you're gonna see a catch up in credit spreads as well too, that they will start to widen out more than they have already because people will start to think that it's not either you buy or you buy some puts or some credit default swaps. Now you actually sell uh, as well too. So it's only been buy, hedge, buy, hedge. 
But if inflation is changing the Fed's priority, then you might actually see selling come all along the lines as well too. The high yield market credit has really changed its stripes in the last few years, even in the last several years. And that these new instruments and this new thinking about the backstop of a, of a central bank has definitely changed it. This is not the way these markets traded 10 years ago, maybe not even five years ago. It is a different kind of animal altogether that I think people need to get their head around. Well, thank you, Jim, for your thoughts today. And as always, thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent offerings are Bianca Research and Arbor Data Science. For further information or any questions, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a great day, everyone.